Bookmark is presented in part by the Alabama Booksmith, located off Highway 31 in Homewood. The Booksmith is Alabama's BookSense.com bookstore, offering today's authors and thousands of signed books, including most Bookmark writers. Winston Groom, known worldwide as the creator of Forrest Gump, is also highly respected for his serious works of history, many of which chronicle America's wars from 1812 to Vietnam. I spoke with Winston Groom at Over the Transom in Fairhope, Alabama. Well, Winston, it's good to see you again. Good to be back. This is not Saturday Night Live, but I've been counting, and you are the guest with the most appearances. <laughs> <laughs> well... I think this this may be the fourth. It must time. mean something, but I don't know what. Well, it means you write a lot of books fast, and they're good. And people want to hear about them. Good. I think this is the fourth time that we've sat and talked. You have moved. Now it looks. You can tell me this is not permanent, but it looks semi-permanent that you've moved from writing novels to a series now of histories. What is it about histories that has seized you? You've written history of. World War I, World War II, War of 1812, before that the Civil War, but these last three especially, something about that has captured you, at least for the time being. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> oh, you boys won't talk well, about it Well, history, wall. history, history. Well, no, I don't think it's permanent. Uh, I have a few good novels left, I hope. If I got the time, I got the books, but after the first uh, history I wrote, which was was the Civil War um, and the Battle of Nashville, I discovered that I really enjoyed it. And it's easier in a way, much easier in some ways, to write a history than it is to write a novel because you don't have to sit there and sweat blood. I mean, history, you know the beginning, you know the middle, you know the end. Now we got to make it all up. Uh, the hard thing about history is you got to do your research, you got to do your work. And so whereas when I would write fiction, I write it maybe two hours a day, but it's very concentrated two hours, meaning nobody bothers me, the phone doesn't ring, uh, that kind of thing, and you walk around and pull your earlobe and do whatever people do. History, you start at nine o'clock in the morning, you may finish at nine at night. One reason is you got to keep running back to the bookcase or the file case and, and go and look up a fact here, a fact there. If you don't have that, you got to stop everything and say, well, now how do I work around that? Can I work around it? Uh, but it keeps me occupied. My wife likes that. My daughter likes that. My dog likes that. Everybody knows where you are. Everybody knows where I am and I'm not going to disturb them. You, I remember when Shrouds of Glory came out. Uh, in one of in a little piece of material, whether it was a preface or an afterward, I don't remember. But you mentioned that you had taken into your house a complete set of what the Confederate the or the well, let's call the or the official records, the official, which is the official records of the no. Indian Confederate armies, which is enormous uh, volume, uh, a labor of love, actually. Uh, I think it's 128 volumes plus appendices and so forth, and each one's about that thick, and there are some. But uh, this was a 1906 version that um, Gloria Jones lent me. She was the widow of James yeah. Jones, and Jim, who wrote From Here to Eternity and a lot of military novels that loved the Civil War, he had bought this thing, and, and only libraries have them. I mean, many libraries, most libraries really don't have them because they take up an entire room. But <laughs> um, Gloria Lent, and it, 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 it's really the starting point. It's, it's the tool from which you work if you want to write Civil War history because it's all the official records, every dispatch, every shred that they could find of both the Union Army and the Confederate armies. 
Um, most of it is extremely dry and worthless as any kind of uh, tool that you might want to quote, but it gives you the perspective. Are there similar sets of documents for 1, 2, and 1812? No. No, that's more scattered. Uh, Find World it where War you I, need it. yes. Uh, the official records of the British uh, <clears throat> involvement in that war exist. I, this time I just bought them. It was easier because I found I'm pretty hard on my research materials. I underline, make notes, dog year. And so I just bought this enormous thing. Uh, it was actually cheaper to buy it than it was to have it transported from England to here. They don't sell them here. Um, but it cost you an absolute fortune, which I don't understand. I don't want to get off on this tangent, but why, when England is no further from, say, New York, than New York is in Los Angeles, does it cost 20 times as much to send something from England to here as it does to send something from Los Angeles to New York? But that's the, what you find out that, you know, you, you'll have a, and I ordered, because most of that literature came from Europe on, on the World War One. Yes. Part. And I found that the book would cost, say, $20 or $30, and the postage was 20 or something, somewhere around there. I'll bet there are professors at the University of Alabama who were teaching there while you were an undergraduate who would be surprised to know what a scholar you, you have become. No, no, they'd be shocked. <laughs> they'd be shocked. I remember one fella, and I, I wish I could remember his name. He was a terrific guy because back in those days, which were the early to mid-1960s, there were still a lot of, of professors at the university who had served in World War II. And in particular, there was this one guy, and I didn't, I'd never met him before, but I had concluded after my junior year that I was going to spend my senior year in <clears throat> marvelous squander of everything <clears throat> other than debauchery. And so in order to do that, I signed up for a couple of, of summer school courses, these correspondence courses. You did, we didn't have computers back then, so they would send you, you you'd buy the, the textbooks, and then they would send written uh, questions, and, and the lectures were written. And obviously they said, well, you know, use whatever text you want to use, but they were all essay questions. And having thought that this was going to be an easy course, it turned out that United States Naval History was probably the hardest course I ever took in my entire life anywhere at any time. <laughs> we had two people doing that. One was John Pancake, who may have been your teacher, and another was a man named Somersell, who was also it taught was, I knew Dr. Somersell. I think it was Pancake. It may have been the other one. Hemingway said that war was the greatest subject for a novelist because it intensified everything and sped everything up, just made everything more, you know, relationships moved faster, emotions, you know. Well, yeah, and it's like a Western. I mean, you know, if you run out of the love story, then you could have to shoot them up, mm -hmm. and you go back and forth. I was just watching, what the heck was I watching the other night, uh, uh, <clears throat> a double feature. Um, she wore a yellow ribbon and fought Apache. Yes. They both have great love stories in them. Uh, very amusing love stories that John Ford could cobble together like no other director could cobble together. But then, you know, you always had the Indians. Right. And when the love story starts going a little bit, well, that's a little hokey. Right. Bring on the Indians. When I, I laughed to myself uh, reading the last couple of your books, because it, early in both the last two, you all, I, I could almost feel you attempting to restrain yourself, but finally giving in on the subject of unpreparedness. We were unprepared <laughs> <laughs> when World War II broke out. We were unprepared when World War I broke out. We were unprepared when the War of 1812 broke out. Uh, this is a chance. It, you really do. Th but we won each time. Well, we've been unprepared for every war. We were unprepared <laughs> in the Civil War. I mean, who the heck was prepared for all that? 
Well, no, no, no one could. Uh, nobody have ever believed it was going to come to that. <clears throat> uh, we were unprepared for Revolutionary War. I can't think of a single war where anybody's been, been really prepared, including, well, I, the, the the first Gulf War. I think we were prepared for that. Right. Um, the second one, we were prepared for the first part. Part two, we were not prepared for. Uh, but that's the the nature of war. Uh, if war, if you could sit down on a piece of paper and and, and quantify it and qualify it, mm -hmm. and say, well. Uh, all we have to do is get these people here and do that, and that's a solution to the problem. We wouldn't have any problem with any war, but, but that is not the way it works. I calculate that <clears throat> you have left to write the Revolutionary War, the Korean War, <laughs> and the Spanish-American War. <laughs> well, that's, that, that's interesting. I, no, I think the Revolutionary War has been well covered by Mr. McCullough and various people like that, and the, uh, um, the Korean War was something that it had also been well covered by people who were there. The Spanish-American War interested me. I did a, a, a play which remains in what I call a, a, my trunk, <laughs> which is things that I know will, will never be published unless I really fish them out and go at it again, but I had a character in this play. It takes place in a veterans hospital down in Biloxi, Mississippi, where there are all these veterans from all the wars. And it turned out, uh, in my story, um, <clears throat> call, uh, that there was a, a character there left over from the Spanish-American War who had been there in, in, in this veterans hospital. He was 90 years old mm -hmm. at that point in, in history. And he had been there for about 25 or 30 years and what they never realized was he indeed was a veteran of the Spanish-American War, but he'd been fighting on the wrong side. Oh, he was a Spaniard. <laughs> All right. But we take care of enemy, That's right. enemy we take care casualties of as well. <laughs> Your latest, Patriotic Fire, um, of course, has as a centerpiece Andrew Jackson, a person who is famous for two things. People hate him for the removal of the Indians, and they revere him for the Battle of New Orleans and essentially the saving of at least the southern end of the Republic. And you, you spent years living with Jackson. And you assess him. I live with him still. He finally. takes up my entire bedroom upstairs. You know, the short, the short version, the postcard. Well. That's a very complicated man. Oh, yeah. He, he, but he was, a, well, I call him, he's an American original. This guy came out of, of the sticks, out of the, the abominable wax hard district, which is either in North Carolina or South Carolina, depending on who you want to believe. And he grew up essentially an orphan. He put himself through law school. He moved to Tennessee where they needed lawyers and uh, became a political power in the state, got himself elected to a generalship in the Tennessee State Militia, yeah. which is the way they did that. He had no formal military training, but of course neither did anybody else uh, in Tennessee in those days. Um, he did, in fact, it, I don't think anybody else but Jackson, anybody they could have sent down there could have won that battle. Um, the person that they had in charge originally certainly could not have. He was a crook and a spy. Uh, for the Spanish and was so punished for that, and Jackson took his place. Yeah. But as a president, I don't know, Jackson gave us essentially two things. He gave us, well, he, he gave us the Democrats. Love them or hate them. Uh, <laughs> he was the founder, sure. essentially, of the Democratic Party. And his removal of the Indians I, I look at it a different way, and I've been asked this question a number of times, and it's a fair question. But I think the great historical fallacy is for people to somehow define and equate uh, ethics and morality of today based on <clears throat> what people saw as ethics and morality 200 years ago. That includes slavery. But in Jackson's case, he was very empathetic toward the Indians. As a matter of fact, he adopted an Indian boy. Mm -hmm. um, 
what he saw was that wherever the white man came in contact with the Indians, for better or for worse, and this is uh, prior to the Battle of New Orleans when he was down fighting uh, the Creek Uprising. Right here in Alabama. Right here in Alabama, 28 miles up the road where it started. He saw that the, the Indians invariably lost and they, they, they were killed. And he, he realized that the only way to, for the Indian tribes to survive was either to disband themselves as tribes and somehow melt into the population, which most of them or many of them were not willing to do, or they were going to have to be moved away. Now, this was a big country then. This was a wild country. Uh, so you could move the Indians from one part of Alabama to the other part of Alabama, and it'd be 10 or 15 years before the white man would start coming in there. Mm -hmm. So Jackson did, in fact, move the creeks way up to North Alabama and over into Mississippi. When, by the time that he became president, now that was, you know, 18 years later, yeah. uh, th there was a huge westward expansion. And Jackson saw that the Indians were, they were losing the fight. They were, uh, they were going to be erased as a tribal people. Okay. So he selected uh, the state of Oklahoma, what is now the state of Oklahoma, what they call Indian Territory. Right. Moving there. Was it cruel? Sure, it was cruel. Um, did Jackson think it was something Indians wanted? Hell no, he didn't. No. But he did it, bec uh, I believe, for two reasons. One, he realized you couldn't stop the white migration, and two, uh, you had to do something about the Indians, otherwise it was going to be bloody slaughters. There's a, there is a case. I, I'm sure there is. I, I, I believe you. I agree with you. It just looks bad. Oh, it looks from terrible. Here. And, and, and what, you know, if, <laughs> if, if the opposite had been true, if he'd done nothing, then you have to go to a what if right. and what would have happened right. to these Indians. Right. We don't know alternative history no, at don't. the moment. You can't know it. My favorite part, the favorite thing in Patriotic Fire is that rampart. I love Jackson's rampart. And I have a question. It has little parts. Why do generals think that running across an open field at a defended position in an infantry charge is a good idea? Why did the British agree to fight the Battle of New Orleans essentially on Jackson's terms by running directly at the place that he had fortified? Why didn't they bring their ladder? <laughs> that, was the, that was the damnedest uh, th three or four days there especially. The, the, the tactics of the thing. I mean, he's, he's set up well, here. They the, could have the, gone around him to the west, even if they couldn't go around him through the swamp to the, to the well, north. Well, they really, they, it, no, it would have been very hard to go around him because you had the Mississippi River to the west mm -hmm. and you had a swamp to the east, and in the swamp were a bunch of yeah. friendly Choctaw Indians who made good tomahawk work. <laughs> yeah, uh, the swamp was guys. a mess. But... The British were fighting on a European model, which they'd fought on for 200 years, which is everybody gets in a line or a column of lines, a line of columns, and they, they dress up uh, in, in, in the gaudiest uniforms they can. <laughs> they have bugles blowing and drums beating. Yeah. And it's essentially like the old, uh, what you see uh, in these films of gorillas where the gorilla goes out in the jungle and the big gorilla beats his chest and sooner or later he's either going to scare off the other gorilla, which is what he hopes to do, or they'll fight and then the other gorilla still runs off. Mm -hmm. And that's what the British had done to Napoleon. Uh, they just finished doing it. Some of the very same soldiers had fought oh, the very same on soldiers. the continent and then come to fight Jackson in New Orleans. Yeah, probably 75% of those those British soldiers were, had been in the Napoleonic Wars, and that's where the British fought it. They fought it in daytime. They didn't fight it at night. Mm -hmm. They didn't use Indian tactics. Uh, they would, you know, that old kind of warfare, you might the line, you stop, you shot, and you kept going, and you intimidated your enemies. Well, Jackson happened to be behind this fortification, and they weren't intimidated, and they were better shots. And they had the, the advantage of most of those guys at what we generally call a Kentucky long rifle, which is accurate 300 yards, where the British musket was accurate about 100 yards. 
When I came to that very paragraph, I just stopped and smiled to myself. I mean, here are the British marching forward, and they're dropping a good hundred yards before they could even begin to shoot. That must have been very depressing, <laughs> but, that, but that's not a question. <laughs> At the time, it probably was. <laughs> Here's the question. Something I've, I've, I've noticed in your books, and obviously we all notice this because history moves along. The thing, that, the thing that did the most damage besides straight out mud in World War I was, let's take the rifled, the rifled barrel in the Civil War, the yeah. machine gun in the First War, the long rifle in 1812, the rifle that would fire accurately 300 yards, and, and so on, and what now we're moving to smart bombs so that, so that technology at every, I mean, war has been your subject half a dozen times, and technology in war is something that you've spent a lot of time with. What, what, what happens to the, not that there won't be soldiers and that they won't be brave, but how, how do you see the, the future relationship between the individual infantryman, a person of courage, and, and Techno the well, military that's what George technology. Patton always complained about. I mean, he, he wanted to go out and fight the enemy man one on one with a yeah. sword, or, or in this case, a tank, uh, or, or something such as that. Uh, he considered it undignified, uh, the, these uh, long, high aerial bombings and this, that, and the other. It was unsoldierly, but he understood the, the situation, which is that's where he found himself. Um, Soldiering is an honorable profession. And it has to change with the times, or otherwise you can go out all you want, um, just as the British did at the Battle of New Orleans, and say, well, these are the tactics that worked for us before, and you get yourself slaughtered. And that was the most lopsided uh, defeat uh, almost in the history of battle, mm -hmm. at, at the Battle of New Orleans in 1812. I mean, there were something like, what, 2,800 British dead and eight Americans. In terms of casualties. Yeah. Just the statistics were terrible. And they didn't get any better day after day either. No. no. <laughs> will we? Will we be waging the war wars twenty or fifty years from now without people? Will you be writing <laughs> about robots? <laughs> well, not necessarily. But uh, we won the war in Serbia without sending any human beings to speak of into Serbia. Well, we had human beings to speak of, but not many of A them. A few pilots. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, you know, you can go to the very far extreme and say, well, nuclear weapons, uh, that would be horrendous. It would be the end of life on Earth as we know it. Uh, certainly that <clears throat> is a horrible uh, yeah. prospect, um, and it gets closer every day as some of these lunatic nations get these doggone weapons, and one of these days somebody's going to use them. Um, I think that, you know, you, you brought up you know, the smart bombs and things like that. You know, by all the smart bombs we have, we're still not winning in Iraq. I mean, we're winning, I mean, we're not getting beaten, but we're not, I mean, we still have to have people on the ground, and that's been the case in every war that I've ever known of, <coughs> where you have to have people on the ground to finally get somebody to say, I give up. All right, within this metaphor of the British using old tactics and attacking Jackson at his ramparts when Jackson had Choctaw Indians and, <laughs> and, and, and Kentucky marksmen on his side. Is, is it at all reasonable to think that we're running into a situation like that in Baghdad where they're, sure. they're the Indians? They're the... Sure. I mean, well, I mean, you know, a handful of people can cause an awful lot of trouble we're fighting them pretty well man to man. We're not losing Baghdad. Baghdad's still there. We run it. But you can't go out of a certain part of it without getting mm -hmm. shot out. And the same thing was true in Vietnam. I was there. I, can, I, I, I mean, I, I can tell you that their place in Vietnam, you just didn't, you went out there, you were going to get shot at. Maybe not hit, but you were going to get shot at. Well, you could get killed getting a cup of coffee in Saigon, too. Yeah, that's possible. It's doubtful. But, uh, I mean, the point is that there will always be these dangers that uh, <clears throat> you, you run a risk in any war of somebody getting killed. I mean, you can't have a war where nobody gets killed, otherwise it's not a war. <laughs> well, I guess so. And, and I, mean, I think the one problem I see with the American people, and it's been so ever since the Revolution, 
uh, with the exception of World War II and World War I, has been great impatience to get it over with, and if it don't get it over with, fire everybody, and not and, and think that well. We're getting all these people killed. Well, sure, you're going to get killed. If you have a war, that's what war is about. It's horrible as it is, it's true. I'm going to war with Jackson because apparently if you if you go to war with Jackson your odds on, that, are good. on that parapet there, your odds are as good as they're going to be anywhere in the world. Yeah. I ask writers all the time, and with you, I know I'm going to get an answer because you've been more productive lately than anybody else around. What, what's next after Patriotic Fire? I'll bet it's half done or more. It's getting to, uh, let's say, a, uh, well, the Battle of Vicksburg. Is that right? Yeah. Good. I, well, it's close <laughs> to home, yeah. and I can go through New Orleans to get there and eat my way through there, which was a lovely thing about doing yeah. you know, the Battle of New Orleans. I mean, I spent six <laughs> weeks in New Orleans eating my way through the city every night. It's a wonder I don't weigh 900 pounds. Because that's where all the research material is. You should write a book set in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes out, I'll read it and we'll talk about it again. That's we'll, a deal. We'll sit and talk again. Thank Great. you very much.